Welcome to Leaders and Laggards. Welcome to this episode of Leaders and Laggards. Uh, my name is Dave Swenson, and I'll be leading the discussion tonight. I've got along with me Ken Riches and Jeff Custer, and we'll be tackling the topic of coaching tonight. I guess I come at it from a coaching in the workplace perspective, but you know, there's we could certainly have a coaching. Uh, uh, individuals or even yourself, right? We could, that could be part of the conversation tonight pretty effectively. Coaching hasn't necessarily always been something that I even knew I was doing, but, you know, going further and further in my career, it just started to make sense. And, you know, working in continuous improvement a lot, uh, one of the things that came up, you know, leading into 2020 was the employee turnover, right? And so everybody wanted to understand how do we retain employees and, and, and that hasn't necessarily changed. Now we've probably got retention of employee concerns for other reasons right now, but we're still struggling with how do we create that workplace that is you know, the best workplace or the most desired workplace or a home, a family for our employees. Um, I've been studying, you know, things like the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, they put out a nice report each year, and you know, if you if you uh, look at other posts, uh, I I can I tend to pay attention to what Sherm is doing as well. And for about a decade now, they've been talking about a need for managers who can coach their employees, and 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 that was uh, maybe my uh, onus for tonight was to say. You know, that last report that came out, I believe it was 2018 from SHRM, where they said, you know, 80% of managers that were polled or took it apart in their, in their research said, hey, I'm not sure that I have the correct skills and or training to effectively coach my employees. And, you know, so to those managers and even people in the audience, I'd say, you know, it's a process. And so if you're not there now, don't necessarily get bound up in that. Just realize that there is a path that you can take to actually become a pretty darn effective coach. And so I wanted to start tonight by reading a quote that, you know, caught my attention a handful of years ago. And so the, the quote is this, coaching is a relatively young profession. And now is not the time for people to be saying, this is how you coach or this is how you don't coach we really need to figure out what coaching is. So I, best, I think the best thing that could be said is that people could say, this is my approach to coaching, but this isn't something that we should be over-regulating at this point. And that, that quote came from Timothy Galloway. And so if you don't know who he is, he was the author of The Inner Game of Tennis. And for me, that is must reading for a manager that wants to learn how to coach or anyone really that wants to learn how to coach effectively. Um, so I got to say, Galloway's had a big impact on me. I'm, I'm glad that a mentor of mine early on said, read this book. <laughs> and if it doesn't make sense to you, read it again. And I've read it a couple of times, even though it made sense to me the first time. Um, you know, but the, the first question that I guess I wanted to start with tonight, and, and maybe I'll just point right to Ken, um, is coaching a skill or a competency in your viewpoint that managers need in the year 2020 or 2022? I, I think in both years, it's, it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's necessary. Um, yeah, and, and I look at it and, and I think that uh, all levels of an organization from the CEO on down to the, the team leader on out on the factory floor should have coaching as a core competency. Uh, it, it, it really is. And, it's, and especially in today's day of ages, as our issues become more complex, we need more and more collaboration in order to be successful. And you hear a lot of uh, buzz around agile and, and things like that, which really goes towards just being able to do things better, faster and quicker. Right. Uh, that I think that really that it has only reinforced the need for, for a coaching skill set in order to be successful in today's environment. Yeah, well said. 
take that, Jeff. What, what's your thought? <laughs> well, you know, what comes to mind for me initially is a couple of weeks ago, we had a really great conversation around leadership styles. And I think if you look in history, you know, the, we, the, the leaders probably tended to be more autocratic. And we spent a lot of time talking about that a couple of weeks ago. And, and over, over time, I think we've migrated somewhat away from, from that autocratic, although we agreed that that's still prevalent. And you, the coaching seems to really fit well as you migrate away from that autocratic. Dave, I'm going to tell you what to do uh, versus a coaching style where I'm going to help you figure out what to do. Right, right. No, yeah, well said. You know, I, and I one think, of the things I think as, as, as a leader in an organization that's important is you need to set yourself up for or set the organization up for when you're not going to be there. And that really only happens through coaching and, and to a certain extent mentoring. But I, I really think through the coaching and, 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 and I'm, I, I think in one of our next questions, we'll say we'll get into what is coaching. But I, I think that, that that's important also is to make sure that there's somebody that's prepared to follow behind us so that things don't fall apart or, or regress. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you, you know, for me, and, and you guys covered almost everything I was going to say, so I, I'll be able to take a real short swat at this. It won't take me very long to answer it. In my opinion, to be a manager or even a frontline leader in this time frame, I just don't see how you can be effective if you don't at least understand what coaching is. I found there to be a tremendous amount of confusion about the difference between coaching and some other activities. And like you said, Ken, we'll get into that later. But so, yes, I believe it's a something that, yes, you need to be able to do it. Maybe at least as importantly, it's something you shouldn't be afraid of. And um, I think that anyone in the organization that has any kind of an uh, authority or leadership role, you better at least understand coaching. I, I'm not saying that you need to be you know, ready to coach CEOs, but you better be able to understand what a coaching conversation is. I think that, you know, one of the things that grabs my attention is when I look on, you know, LinkedIn or any of the other sites, and I see people advertising these classes, and I think to myself, well, boy, if, if you really had a coaching culture, if you spent some time really understanding what it would take to get to the level of relationship with your employees that you'd have to be at to be an effective coach, you know, do you need conversation do you need classes on things like uh, emotional intelligence right you're already going to understand that in a coaching conversation to be an effective coach do you need uh, things like um yeah i'm going to say even i'm not sure that you'd need things like a diversity and inclusion training if you really have a coaching culture you're already there right you're already valuing these people and and so my push to people would be to say boy really really look at what what, what you could get done being a coach before you start bolting on things like those classes or, you know, onboarding classes. If you want to change your culture, learn how to be a good coach. Yeah, but I think there's a, a, a gap in that there are not a lot of organizations that necessarily have that coaching culture. I and, agree. And for those organizations, some of those tools and some of, those, some of that training you're talking about actually will add value. Yep. And I think when we get to the, uh, the last question for the night, I think we'll probably cover some of that too. Absolutely. All right, hey Dave, you know, well, and I just, one, one last, one last comment, you know, I think, I think to me, when I, when I think about coaching and, and kind of Ken's talk about coaching culture, you know, I think along with that, you need to have an organization that has high trust levels. Right. You know, if, if, if you're a low trust organization, which probably more equal, equal equals the the autocratic stuff if you don't have that high trust i think i think coaching is going to be hard to pull off i agree with you yep yeah so i don't think it's something that should be farmed out either i'm not an advocate of the hr group being the coaching group <laughs> right <laughs> no um you know because you need to have a relationship with people a anyway we'll move on but i i just think if if you put yourself to becoming a good coach and understanding what listening is all about and connecting with people and building those relationships. Some of these other things, they're just automatic. Yep. All right. 
So next question, and I guess I'll start here with you, Jeff. Um, at a high level, maybe could you under, could you explain to the um, audience, what is it, you know, how would you define what coaching is? Okay, so that's the first part of the question, but part B of the question is, can you give us an example of maybe some things that get confused with coaching? You know, people say I'm coaching, but the actual activity that they're undertaking, um, it's probably not really coaching, it's something else. Yeah, I, I probably start off with, you know, maybe just some attributes of what, what a coach might look like. You know, I think a, a coach is, is probably a curious person there and, and they're a person that, that really listens, you know, they, they don't just surface listen. They really listen to what people are saying. And then probably to me, the most important point that to me almost equals coaching is you're able to ask really good questions. Um, you know, it's, it's that ability to ask good questions, I think, that really can make leaders that are listening into really effective coaches. You know, they, they aren't, you know, you, you contrast that like we already talked about with autocratic where, you know, you're talking to your employee. No, that's not coaching. Coaching is listening. It's, it's not telling that team member what to do. And, you know, and it's not jumping to conclusions, you know, it's, it's, it's asking questions, good questions. You know, I, I, I like to talk with people about getting good at asking questions. You know, don't ask that closed end question where somebody can say yes or no. You get, you get good and practice at ap asking those open-ended questions that really draws out information. And then you got to listen. And, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things uh, when I think about asking those questions, Jeff, is um, they need to be clarifying questions. They shouldn't be questions that are disguised as advice. Yes. They should really be seeking clarification and not giving an opinion or, or direction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then Dave, I think probably the second part, you kind of like what, you know, what do people get confused with coaching? I mean, one of the things that pops into my mind is, is just differentiating between coaching and mentoring. Right. Um, you know, I think that, you know, in, in some ways on the surface, they maybe sound like the same thing or pretty similar things. And, you know, for me, coaching is more, you know, probably a hands-on, you know, you're, you're coaching somebody as they're actually, you know, doing their work task. Or, um, you know, Ken, you talked about factory floor, you know, so you're out there asking those good questions, you know, working with that person as they're, as they're actually accomplishing their, their work. Whereas I think mentoring more is, is geared towards that developmental type thing. You still, hopefully you're asking good questions if you're in a mentoring role, but the kind of questions you're really, you're really geared towards development versus getting the task done. I mean, I think that's something, Dave, that, that I think maybe is, hard maybe people just don't understand yeah i think i think you're exactly right can you have anything to add yeah i uh to me uh i, I really like uh jeff discussing the attributes uh and and to me part of it is is what does it look like you know and what is your goal as a coach your goal is that you want to improve results i mean i mean and as part of that you're looking at goal setting creating outcomes and but you want them to come up with the understand those and come up with their the goals and the outcomes uh and and through the questions you as as jeff indicated you can help guide that that discussion and 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 about and it's also about managing change yeah um i think for uh the second part of the question what is it not it's not therapy it's not consulting <laughs> as jeff said it's not mentoring and more importantly, it's not training either. You're not, you know, you're not there to train. There's a different time as a leader when you need to, to go into training mode. And uh, there's an article from uh, the Harvard Business Review. It was from uh, 1999 and it's called uh, Who's Got the Monkey? And uh, that was one that just really resonated with me. And I, I think that of probably one of the most important aspects of coaching is that through coaching, you do not want to except the monkey and and again if you if you're not familiar with that uh that study it's uh from the uh harvard business review november december 1999 issue no it's funny i 
I have a, I have a leadership coach that I meet with regularly and, and she uses that conversation all the time. <laughs> she yeah. is regularly telling me that's not my monkey. That's your monkey. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's great. You brought that up. So, you know, for me, I say that, you know, it, cause I, I run a fair amount of coaching classes, right? That's kind of gotten to be something that I get a lot of pull for. And one of the things that I we will usually address really quickly is what we're going to use as a definition for coaching. And so I always say that if you're going to define coaching, it's an approach that you're going to take to help an individual achieve goals and results in a fulfilling way. And maybe it, as important as anything else, it's going to be done in an acceptable amount of time. Right. Um, so it's, you are helping that person to get those things done, but it's not your job to do it for them. And honestly, you really don't even need to know what it is they're doing, right? So, you know, we think if you're going to be a football coach, you need to understand football. Well, when we're talking about professional coaching or maybe in, in individual coaching, you don't need to be the football coach. You just need to be able to ask the right questions and guide the conversation and hold some accountability. Um, and as far as what it's not, that it often gets uh, confused with, you know, you, both of you have brought up mentoring, so I won't beat that dead horse any further, but what coaching is not, and I, and I find this almost everywhere, it's not disciplinary actions, yep. right? So yep. people will say, well, I need to pull you aside and have a, a coaching and you need to sign the coaching form. That's not <laughs> coaching. That's providing disciplinary feedback. Yeah. Right. And so let's, the, let's differentiate that right now. Um, there is a time and a place for mentoring and there's a time and a place for correctively providing feedback, right. And corrective and appreciative feedback. Right. And, and that could probably be its own show, just that subject, but good God, people stop saying you're doing coaching when you're, when you're applying discipline and thinking that using the term softens the conversation, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that comes after, you know, that's at, like you mentioned the accountability piece. And to me, that's uh, one of the biggest differences between coaching and mentoring is that coaching really is about the accountability and you're looking to improve results. Yes. And, and if you don't get that desired outcome, then that's when you go into positive discipline. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So it all flows, but let's not conflate terms, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I like Ken. I, I, I just laugh too when you say positive discipline. <laughs> I don't hey. think I've ever been in an organization where that's happened, where too much either the person doing it or receiving it felt it was positive. <laughs> well, it's, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be going in escalation, right? The first, yeah, I know. first one is verbal. <laughs> so it's a discussion and, you know, you're not, you know, hopefully you're not. I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I say, I think that topic yep. maybe could be its own show for us. But yes, yes. Yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, so the last question, and I'll go back to you on this one, Jeff, and it's really just what would you give as a recommendation to our listeners, right? If, if they said, you know what, I, I like the conversation that I've heard tonight, and maybe I'd like to sharpen my skills when it comes to coaching or become more confident, or at least understand what coaching is and what it's not. Yeah. Um, what would your recommendations be to the listeners over, you know, and, and, and I don't really care for the, you know, I, I don't want to short sell that conversation, but let's not focus on a one to seven day plan, but more, what could you do in 30 days? What could you do in 90 days? What could you do in 180 days? What could you do in the next year? Right. What would that path look like? Yeah, so it's kind of fun. To me, it sounds like we're coaching the coach. <laughs> right, right. So I really would go back, I think, to, to practicing your questioning. And I, I've done this with some people where they'll, they'll ask a question, you get done, and they ask that closed-end question, and it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. But I've right. gone back and said, what would happen if you changed that question just slightly and made it an open-ended question and, and what you draw from somebody. Um, you know, I, th I think that is probably something that if you're, if you're not well-versed in that, it takes some practice. It's going to take a while. 
uh, to kind of to teach yourself to catch you saying closed in question. Um, one of the other things I like to do that that's something that I think takes some practice is I like using the phrase, tell me more. And, um, you know, it, uh, it, it reminds me of a situation I had one time with a, a construction firm that was working for me. And he came into my office one day, had some kind of problem, some difficult construction thing that um, he wasn't, he, he, at least he indicated he wasn't quite sure. And uh, you guys might know this, my background isn't that, I'm a finance guy. <laughs> And he comes and asks me these technical questions. Well, I don't really know the answer, but I did know well enough to ask him questions and good questions. I said, well, tell me about this. Um, what do you think we ought to do? And tell me more. And, right. and he laid out, he laid out for me, oh, I think we should do this, 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 and this. And I said, that sounds really good. Go do that. And I think it takes some practice Especially if I was if I was in a different boat where I had come out of that environment, the temptation is is to tell them how to do it, and it takes some disciplined practice to get yourself out of telling and starting to ask. Yeah. All right. Ken. Yep. I uh, number one on my list, uh, similar to Jeff, practice asking questions. And then uh, I added to that though, and I said, and listening. Ah, uh, yep. And, uh, but, in, and I kind of took the, uh, when I was thinking about this question, I kind of took the, the tactic more of, you know, as we talked about before, if you're in, a, in an organization that already has a culture of coaching, then there's not as much you need to do. But I kind of took the approach of maybe you're in an organization that doesn't have that. And, and, you know, and so I looked at a 30, 60, 90 day, you know, 30, the first 30 days, taking the initiative to learn about coaching uh, and, and do some training for yourself, you know, look up conscious versus unconscious coaching, uh, take a personality profile yourself, whether it's DISC, mm -hmm. whether it's Briggs Myers or anything like that, but, and, and start practicing, make sure you understand your profile and how you communicate and what your hot buttons are and where your weaknesses are, but also start observing your team and the people that you want to be coaching and start figuring out where they really fit within that person personality profile. So you can have the best way to communicate with them and start building that trust that, that Jeff and, and David, you both talked about. You know, and then it's, it's putting, putting some of that into action and then it's starting to look for results and really starting to, to execute your plan when you're at 90 days. Yeah. It's hard to add. You guys really knocked it out of the park. I think it was that last set of questions, last set of answers. Um, you know, so, so as I started, first thing I would recommend people don't go jump in a one day or a three day seminar and think, voila, you're a coach. Right. Um, Honestly, I'd, I'd, I'd push you back a little bit and say, start with being curious about learning who you are as a person. Like you said, Ken, go out and get that, you know, I prefer disc, but boy, you're right. Yeah. You could have a good conversation or a good uh, aha moment with uh, uh, Briar, Myers Briggs as well. Um, I guess I got it backwards. But yeah. <laughs> and then, and, and if you're going to do disc, make sure you do the uh, emotional intelligence part of it too, so that you understand yep. your motivations and not just your yep. style. Yep. And so, yeah, I would say go through, uh, uh, go through the assessment, and if you can, maybe you know get with a uh, somebody that can run you through, you know, just what that means, right? Yeah. Um, I recommend that people read a few books, right? So for me, um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't benchmark it and say, well, geez, what's worked for everybody else is going to work for you because you are an individual. Um, and so the three that I would throw right at people, as I'd say, depending upon where you're at in the in industry, and maybe you could read all three of them anyway. Um, but as I started the conversation early on, I'd read the inner game of tennis. I, I think that's something that is almost a must read for people that want to coach um, the coactive coaching, uh, you know, is written by, uh, a couple from England, um, struggling with their names right off the top of my neck, my head here. Um, 
uh, Karen and Henry uh, Kimsley Howes, right? So uh, that's a great resource. Honestly, uh, it's not a bad, it wouldn't be time poorly spent to read through uh, the Toyota Kata book if you've not read through that. Um, so, so it really depends what it is that you want to do as a coach. I'd watch some of these things on YouTube. Uh, and, and if it doesn't make sense to you when people are going through their coaching exercises, it's probably for a reason, right? Find what resonates with you because there are a lot of good coaching models out there. There's a lot of good approaches to it, uh, but find what works for you. And, and maybe finally, you know, kind of building on what you said, Ken, um, I, I'm an advocate of a BHAG, right? So I would create a big, hairy, audacious goal around what you're going to get accomplished in the next year, what you need to learn, who you need to uh, uh, connect with to make this happen, and, and what's in it for you. But, you know, if you don't write it down and if you don't start, well, chances are good that it's not going to happen. Uh, don't run out today and hire a coach to teach you how to be a coach. Figure out what, what they should be doing before you hire one would be my recommendation. And, and the other, I guess the final recommendation is, is if someone wants to come and coach you, figure out if they have a leadership coach, because if they're not willing to eat this puppy dog chow, um, why should <laughs> you be eating what they're trying to sell, right? So make sure they have a coach and they live the, they walk the talk, I think would be my final uh, advice for the, for the audience. Any final words on coaching from either one of you? Uh, just I, and I've mentioned it before, but I just uh, I really believe in uh, keeping an outward mindset and asking what is it I can do for you today, and not get caught up in your in your silos and and in yourself. Yeah, yeah, Dave. I would close with, you know, to me, uh, uh, with all the things we've talked about tonight, if you can get good at those things, it's so empowering to. A work group, uh, the style, the coaching, it's going to encourage them to, to learn, to grow, to be innovative. And uh, I think it's an exciting thing that it just encourage people to do all the things, Dave, that you just talked about. Okay. Yeah. And the spirit of March Madness, right? Go team. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Go team. That's right. Uh, all right. Well, I think we're going to bring this episode to a close. Uh, appreciate the audience for, uh, uh, taking the time to pay attention to what we had to say on this subject. Uh, really appreciate everything that both Jeff and Ken brought to the table, and we'll see you in the next session. Thanks for watching, and remember, leadership matters.